This is a 1/18th scale crawler, and for many years I've taken advantage of the fact that a 1/12 scale Tamiya body has the same wheelbase. So whenever in the past I've needed a sturdy four-wheel drive vehicle that can rescue an off-road car on a trailer from an off-road situation or maybe launch and recover a boat, I've tended to use this. It doesn't really do justice to this lovely body to have it perched so high on top of a crawler chassis, however. I'd like to try and make it more scale. My first plan was to take this crawler, build it an aluminium twin rail chassis and make it into something more credible. Before I got round to doing that, however, an old friend of mine fixed his crawler and we took both of them out together and I enjoyed it so much. I didn't want to limit this thing's off-road capabilities by turning it into a scaler, so I had a change of heart and decided to buy something else to fill that role. Eventually, I settled for this 1/18th scale crawler from WL Toys. It's got live axles all the way. It's built to a very low price, obviously. It's borderline hobby grade, I'd say. It comes with 2.4 gigahertz radio and a lithium battery of some sort, lithium ferrous, I think. Behind the cab, the chassis doesn't extend very far. It comes to more or less the rear of the foremost of the two rear wheels. I'll get it charged up so I can check that it works. And assuming it does, then I'll start taking off this mock tubular roll cage so we can see what we've got underneath. What I'd like to do is have some sort of flatbed and just the cab part of a pickup body. However, I cannot bring myself to cut this beautiful vintage midnight pumpkin body in half. So what I've done instead is to buy a cheap ABS generic 1950s US pickup body from Camtech. I won't have any qualms about cutting this up because it's so easily replaceable. I've cut out the body and I also cut away the rear portion. So we're left with that. I'm not particularly pleased with the top edge of this cut. I should have cut it a bit higher because I've cut it on the point where it curves back out and up. I'll trim this edge a little higher, get it nice and straight and true, and then I'm going to try and fill in that rear panel. Before I go any further, I think I'll take that little 6x6 out and have a look at what it can do off-road.
All right, what did we learn from that? Well, oddly enough, it has a very progressive throttle when it's in reverse, but this particular example, when you're going forwards, you can squeeze the trigger, nothing happens, squeeze it a bit more, and then suddenly it just takes off at top speed. So basically the throttle's on or off, which isn't what I was hoping for. They're advertised as having progressive throttle control, and certainly others which I've seen on YouTube do seem to have a much more progressive throttle just as progressive when going forwards, in fact, as when going backwards, but I've been unlucky in that respect. The other thing that surprised and rather shocked me is that those aren't prop shafts. There's a motor in each axle, and those mock prop shafts are effectively a third link. So you could say it's three-link suspension with the mock prop shaft serving as the third link. Still, now I've scratched the itch to drive it, it's time to settle down and get the cage off this thing. Going back to the cab, there are two jobs I have to do here. Firstly, obviously, I have to fill in this scraping hole at the back. And secondly, for some reason, Camtech supply it with no rear window marked in. So I spent a very pleasant hour yesterday looking at 1950s pickups on YouTube and I've discovered that they had quite a big rear window, so I'm just going to design my own and cut it in. But first I think I'll get the tricky business of filling in this gap out of the way. The first thing I've done is cut myself a cardboard template, which fits in there reasonably snugly. Then I duplicated that on a sheet of one millimeter styrene, which I asked for and got for my birthday. My first attempt at using sheet styrene didn't come out too badly. I've blocked in the back of the cab and reinforced it with a couple of strips cut from the same one millimeter sheet. Here's the rolling chassis. Once I've removed the roll cage, it actually came off with just four screws down here underneath and a bit of jiggery pokery because of the wires for the LEDs. I've kept two LEDs out of the six. I'm hoping to use those as my headlamps in the truck. In order to make a chassis, I've bought some 10 by 10 millimeter aluminium C-channel. And some 10 by 10 millimeter aluminium angle. I've done a little drawing of the chassis I'd like to build. It's a straightforward ladder chassis with the only unusual thing about it being variations in the height of the cross members to accommodate variations in the height of the surface I'm building it onto. What I mean by that is that the front cross member will come across here at this height and the rear cross member will come across here where it's slightly lower. And I've varied the height of my cross members in my design to hopefully account for some of that. I've cut my C-channel and angle into various chunks and hopefully the whole thing should go together something like this where this cross member is resting on the lower flange and this one, the one nearer the front, is butted up against the uppermost flange. At the rear, where it's visible, I've used C-channel to save C-channel at the front, where it'll be covered under the body, I've just used angle. I've riveted the chassis together and temporarily bolted it to the car. It sits a little tail high. I think I should remove this cross member's rivets and re-rivet it in place above this flange of this C-channel. That would help. If not, I might have to put a spacer under the front one. For the front, there were two existing holes. And I was able to enlarge them and use 3mm bolts. At the back, I had to drill a couple of bolt holes. But it wasn't challenging. I screwed that up. Got to fix that. Need to re-drill. But it would carry the cab something like this. If I 
turn that round. Quite tall, but not too ridiculously tall. I've whipped the wheels and the shock absorbers off to paint them. I had hoped to try dyeing them with fabric dye, which I saw somebody do on YouTube. Because the problem is when you paint wheels like this, they'll tend to get chipped. And as the shock absorbers work, they're bound to wear. And you'll end up with this nasty colour poking back through my lovely rust. So I had hoped to dye them. But I don't have any dye, and my motorbike flatly refuses to start. But I do have paint, so I'm going to paint them instead. I've painted the shock absorbers black and splodged some dirty coloured paint around the chassis. Here's the chassis with the wheels back on. The shock action isn't quite as slick as it was before I painted the shock absorbers. I'm hoping that's because the paint's still tacky and that it'll sort itself out as the paint dries. If not, I'm going to bitterly regret having painted them instead of dyeing them. This vehicle is going to need a fairly robust tow hook. So I've added an extra rail to the chassis, cut out a cardboard template and then cut out the same shape from aluminium. My first aluminium tow hitch failed because the material I'd used was very thick. The second one I made with much thinner stuff and it's pretty robust. I haven't yet considered how I'm going to mount the body but I have trimmed it so it sits in place. And I know where it's going to go. It sits quite naturally with the arches directly over the wheels. You can push it back but it wants to go forward like that. So that's where it's going to sit. Quite a few years ago now I was out for a walk in some woodland and I looked down and I saw the side of an old drawer. What caught my eye was the fact that the end had been dovetailed so the item must once have been of quite good quality. And it turned out to be this incredibly resilient and useful hardwood. I picked up that side of an old drawer and over the years I've made quite a few bumpers from it. So today I drew around the front of my cab, made myself a cardboard template, drew around that, cut it from my wooden board with a jigsaw and rounded it off to form a front bumper for the truck. I don't know what wood this is, but it can take the knocks. If this were pine or something, I'm sure it would have broken just while I was cutting it out with the saw or while I was sanding it. But this stuff you can bolt to the front of a truck and crash it into things, and it just doesn't seem to break. I've never broken one of these wooden bumpers made from this particular drawer. I've been thinking about how I'm going to mount the body. So far what I've done is this. I didn't want to fix anything directly to the plastic part, so I've bolted everything to the chassis, which is bolted to the plastic part itself. So, running as a bridge across here, is this, which provides a vertical face, to which I can screw this vertical face. And here, we have little chassis outriggers, which reach out and touch the inside of the body on either side. I'm thinking I'm going to glue a block of wood in there and in there and back this with blocks of wood so that I can put screws through and fix it in place. I may need some sort of front support as well. With my wooden blocks glued on I found I didn't have any tiny screws to put through, so I took them from this thing, which is covered in them. But that's pretty firm. I've cut out a couple of pieces of styrene. One is to go here, and the other here but I can't install them till I've sprayed the body. I can't install the lights till I've sprayed the body. I can't do much at the front end of this whole vehicle until I've sprayed the body, and the thing that's preventing me from doing that is that I haven't yet settled on a colour. 
Still, there's nothing to stop me working on the flatbed. This is an A4 sized sheet of styrene. It's two millimeters thick and it's quite expensive. So I'm hoping that I can get away with using it this way round, in which case it'll be about half that size. I needed to find a way to trim the edges of the flatbed. I went out to the shops and I could only find plastic angle in this rather large size, which is too big for my purposes, but I bought it anyway and I cut it down by hand to 10 by 10 millimeters. Using the 10 by 10 millimeter stuff, I trimmed the edges so that it fits on like this and looks about right to me. I think the next thing for me to do is to fabricate some brackets which will mount to the chassis and build this thing a rear bumper. I noticed that on maximum deflection the wheels were touching the underside of the load bed. So I drilled these two cross members and bolted to them lengths of wood which do the job of holding the bed up just enough so that they don't touch. So I just put it in position, we're fine. This car comes with six working lights. There are four on the roof and two at the front, but they're very close together. I've extended these wires and cut the circuit board in half so that now the headlights can be positioned in the headlight buckets. Here they are switched on. Here are the spotlight bodies. I'm going to cut them out of their supporting framework, paint the insides of them silver, and then just glue them to the back of the holes for the headlights in my truck body. I've just glued them in place. They don't look as convincing, I think, as my usual tin foil light buckets, but I suppose the compensation is that they do light up. These are a couple of brackets I'm making up. I'll be bending them into a out, down, and then out again pattern in order to support this, which will become the rear bumper. I've masked the body up, ready to spray it. This time, I'm going to try the salt technique, where you first spray the car in rusty colours, then sprinkle it with salt, and then spray it with the top colour, then wash off the salt. I've painted it, I just found every rust related colour I could and gave it a squirt of everything. It's come out disappointingly shiny as you can see. Maybe I'll flat it back before I add the salt. Here's the salted body. Apparently I'm now supposed to wait a couple of hours for it to dry before I can go ahead and spray on my top coat. I've just hit it with a coat of very pale blue paint and now I'm going to have to be patient and wait until tomorrow before I can wash off the salt and see what sort of result I've got. And with the salt scraped off, it looks like this. I'm actually quite pleased with the way it's come out. I did, however, spray a combination of bronze and silver paint onto these things, hoping that they'd look like rusty steel, and I think they do need more work. One thing I am pleased with is the way that the salt settle quite lightly here, so on the passenger side there's comparatively little rust on this running board, but on the driver's side the running board's very rusted, as if by constantly getting in and out he'd worn the paint away. I wanted the flatbed at the back to be covered in wood, but I didn't want the wood to look new. Luckily, while out for a walk some years ago, I found a bunch of these wooden strips They're very thin, and one side is unweathered, while the other's weathered to this lovely grey colour, which I just don't know how to fake. When I built the farm cart, or dray, that I used in my Triumph Stag video, I used these wooden strips to cover the decking. They're very wide on here, as you can see. They'd be, ooh, probably two feet wide or something or even three feet wide in real terms. So, for the back body, 
I cut each one into three and then I just used epoxy to fix them down. One thing that I did learn from the dray is that it's useful to install some system for retaining things. So this has these little tie down pegs every so often so that you can tie a cargo onto the bed. I'm going to need to do something similar with this. But for the first time we get a reasonable idea of how the truck's going to look. Of course there's still a long way to go. The cab needs headlamp lenses, front bumper, driver, glazing, door handles. The back body needs some sort of system so I can tie things down and of course a back bumper, back lights, license plate and of course here we need to put some sort of fuel tanks. Here's the truck with the Ford Model Y Wrecker I built recently to give an idea of the relative sizes. I might as well take this opportunity to introduce the truck's driver. He's an action figure, a five inch action figure from the Welsh television show Torchwood and the action figure actually depicts an American serving for some reason in the Royal Air Force so those are RAF blues but I'm hoping they'll pass for a reasonably convincing pair of overalls when he's sitting in the cab. Regarding the paint, I did see Josh from RC Every Day using a product by a company called Modern Masters which actually coats your body in real rust and excitedly I clicked on the link that he provided and tried to buy it only to find that the seller doesn't ship to England. So I went on Amazon.co.uk and I found the product but I didn't buy it. In the US it cost $44 here in England it costs £103, which is $144. I've glued into place the two pieces of styrene which I cut previously to block up this and this when viewed from outside. And with them in, I was able to put in my lights and their wiring. And here's the rear bumper fitted and painted. There is a matter which isn't usually an issue on the RCs that I build because they tend to be quite low and that's this being able to see in through the wheel arch business I don't like that so to do something about it I've cut myself a couple of card templates I need to replicate these in styrene paint them and get them glued into the body so now my wheel arches are a little bit fuller but unfortunately the axle touches the styrene so I'm going to have to put a little semicircular trim in there I think. One other thing I did was to fill in this area. I didn't want to use any more of my expensive styrene so this is actually the base of a plastic food container which I was going to throw away. The body's getting heavier and heavier with all these styrene panels I'm adding but seeing as the vehicle sits so high I think it's worth taking the trouble. When making the rear bumper I put too much thought into how it looked and didn't really consider practicalities. I've made it so that it does stick out past the tyres on either side. I regret that. I think it was a bad idea, so I propose to trim it back a little and maybe angle the edges as it comes up. Sort of something like that. There, that's a bit better. I also cut down this annoying overlong tow hitch bolt while I was at it. One problem with relieving the wheel arch inserts to accommodate the tyre is back to the old problem of being able to see in here. To deal with that problem I've cut a couple of pieces of this styrene angle and I'm just going to glue them on like that and add yet more weight to this poor body. I did find that I had to trim them a little at the front so that the body would sit on again but now it does and we've successfully closed off this annoying bright gap. This is some T-section aluminium stock which I got from a hardware store. I've cut a bit of it down to 10 millimeters by 5 and I'm going to use that to make the bracket for my rear registration plate and also to make my rear lights. 
I've pilot drilled for the two back lights. This part's going to be the license plate holder. And the idea is that these homemade lenses made from medicine blister packs will poke through these holes. So I'm going to drill these out till they're a tiny bit bigger than this. Here are the back lights cut out ready to spray black and there below them is the license plate mount. Camtech bodies come without any panel lines. For my Ford Cortina build, the Ford Escort, Triumph Stag and my drag truck, I just drew them on. My Ford Taunus had them scratched in with a Dremel on the doors, bonnet and boot lid. Here are the rear lights and the license plate bracket. I hope to try and make them illuminate. So I removed the light bar from the top of the roll cage and dremeled out two of the light units and I've cut them down. Here are the inserts now that I've ground them down to a square section and flattened them as much as I could. And the idea is that I will glue this now square insert up against the inside of the rear light and the LED will fit in there. I had intended to deal with the front turn signals or indicators by drilling through the body to the correct size which is 8mm in my case or about 3 eighths of an inch and poking the turn signals through from behind. Unfortunately, to do that, I would have had to have done it before I installed this bulkhead. So instead, I've just glued them on with epoxy. As you can see, I've also done the headlight lenses. I'm getting to show up a little bit better. I made these from a pill packet, once again. The trick is not to pop the pills out, but to cut a neat circle in the aluminium behind it and drop the pill out, and then it's not distorted, and you can use it to make wonderful scale headlamp lenses. So now I think it's time to install the front bumper. If you remember I carved it from wood quite some time ago and in order to fit it I plan just to drill a couple of holes here and here and screw it through from the inside. And there's the bumper held in place by a couple of screws which I took from the roll cage of the donor vehicle. I've been working on the lights. As you can see the front ones are working and I've also made up a harness. For the two rear lights. The trouble is each of these uses a lower voltage than is supplied. So on the original circuit board there's a ballast resistor to take the voltage down to the right level and I've had to retain those. So these boards are quite big. If I block out the light for a second with my thumb you can clearly see the resistor. I'm hoping I can still conceal them effectively. So there are the back lights. I've run the wires from the plug through the inside of this chassis rail and then down to the first light and then across through the bumper to the second. Let's switch them on. They're a bit too bright so I need to add some more redness to the red spray paint I sprayed onto the inside of these lenses. I've put the driver in by taking advantage of the chassis outriggers which carry the body. Annoyingly though he sits a little too high so I'm going to have to find some way of lowering him a little. I've made up this little styrene fuel can holder to screw to the back of the truck cab. I think I'll paint it the same rusty brown as the rest of the supposed steel on the truck. I've sprayed it 
with rusty colours, but it's come out disappointingly glossy. However, I have a potential solution. I've bought this, which claims to offer a matte finish. So I'll give this a go and see if it does in fact dull down that horrible shine. I've just sprayed it on and I can actually see that it's attacking the paint. The paint's all bubbling and turning grey and I'll be very interested to see how it looks when it's dried. I sprayed that lacquer on far too thickly so it wasn't a fair test. After it had finished dissolving the paint and turning it grey and bubbly it did actually all dry the original colour and slightly more matte but I think I owe the stuff a better test before I condemn or praise it. I've put some tie down hooks on the sides of the load bed. I used a lot of pop rivets when I was building this aluminium chassis and I used some of the leftover bits to form the tie down hooks. After a fair amount of fiddling around I got the driver sitting at more or less the right height. He's clutching the top half of a steering wheel made simply from a length of electrical cable. It's time to glaze the windows of the cab. I've made myself some cardboard templates and cut the bottom out of an old food container. I'm going to cut that up now and glue it in. Number plates, registration plates, license plates. As this vehicle so plainly American, I've given it a left-hand drive configuration, so there's no nothing constraining me to forcing me to give it English number plates. So I've made these up in what I consider to be an American-looking style. Um, that is, of course, WL18628. That's the catalogue number of the original little truck on which this thing's based. Here's the bracket for the rear plate. The front one I'm just going to glue straight to the front bumper. So there's the front. And the rear. So now my six-wheel drive off-road truck need some sort of fuel tanks. These are on the WPL B24 and this is what you get on the WPL B1. Mine are going to have to be a bit bigger than these though. And because these are made by injection moulding and I'm going to fabricate mine, mine are going to be something of a different shape. I thought I'd start with the left hand one and here I've cut a piece of very thick styrene. It used to be the door of an electrical junction box and four pieces of much thinner one millimetre styrene, two to form end caps and two to form formers halfway along the length of the thing. I've assembled them and now I've just got to wait for the glue to dry so I can get on with trying to skin the things. The fuel tanks are taking a long time to dry so I need to find a few things to do while I wait. One of them is that I'd like to install an upright down here so I've sprayed a piece of styrene, the same colour I painted the cab. I'm going to cut a couple of uprights from it. My mixed pack of styrene sheet contains all sorts of varying thicknesses from 2 millimetres, or about a twelfth of an inch, down to 0.5 millimetres, or about 20 thou. So as you can see, the thin one is almost as pliable as a sheet of paper and it's this that I'm going to use to sheet the outside of my tanks. Now we'll see how flexible the stuff is. I've just glued it so it's held together with a great deal of sticky tape but there are two holes pre-drilled to accept a self-tapping screw which line up with the holes on this flange so the tank will sit in the vehicle like that, one on either side. So the first fuel tank, the one I intend to go on the left, is done. It still needs some sort of filler neck and cap. But when I offered it up in place, it looked huge. So big in fact that I didn't want to make another enormous fuel tank for the other side. It just didn't look right. It looked as though the truck could never ever need such enormous tanks. So 
on the other side I decided to make a storage box. I actually made the decision when I just glued up the right hand fuel tank and I quickly pulled the skin off and this is the base of the fuel tank and these are the four formers. I've just cut them down. So there you go, a little out external storage box. And here's my filler neck and cap, cannibalised from an old pen. It wasn't working anymore. And would you like salt with that, sir? So I've sprayed them both matte black. Let's knock the salt off and see what we got. Firstly, here's the fuel tank. And here's the belly box. For quite some time there's been a shiny little silver bucket lurking under the workbench in my scale shop. I've sacrificed that bucket, painted it a bit scruffy and I'm going to stick it in here. For the first time ever I've got everything screwed down, back bed, body and everything plugged in all at once. So this is how the fruit of my labours looks. I guess the only thing to do now is to see how well it drives. show you the way. And with that, the truck blew up. Transmitter switched on.
truck switched on. The lights work, if nothing else. But no response. Well, that's not good enough. I've got a speed controller on order from Model Sport UK. I've got a brand new radio, transmitter and receiver for it. So I'm just going to have to upgrade to proper electronics. So, do I regret having chosen this WL Toys chassis on which to base my model? No, not really. I always intended to upgrade the electronic components. I think it's shocking and disappointing that this truck has blown up so quickly. But I'm sure that next time you see this thing, it'll have proper electronics. Until then, thank you very much for sticking with me through this long video. I hope you enjoyed the build. I certainly enjoyed building the truck. Thanks for watching.